How many have something to be thankful for? This is Thanksgiving season. How many have something to be thankful for for this, this week, this weekend? Yes, everybody, everybody. I, I just was just thinking about Renee, and I've had such a, an incredibly busy, busy week this last week. I just can't believe all of the things that happened. And every one of them ended up bringing a blessing to us. You know, it didn't start out to be such, such wonderful things. I think we made, I know I made four different trips to the hospital this week to be with, to be with different people, but each time was, uh, the last one was sitting right here in front of us. Yeah. Terry and Carol, bless you guys. But we were praying for, for Carol. Last one, I just we laid hands on her and we're praying for her. And the presence of God came into the room, manifested in such a powerful way as it just whoo, came into the room. We walked away just blessed from that encounter with God. It's like, hmm, thank you, Lord, for another encounter. We had two different people. In fact, Friday morning we had two different families come to our house. and We served breakfast to one, and that just as soon as they left, we're serving breakfast to the next and what a blessing that was for us to have them around our kitchen table, to have people that, you know, to eat with and, and, and just to be able to, to bless them and for them to just turn around and bless us. It's sometimes such a blessing in our lives to be a blessing to somebody else, isn't it? That's what it's really all about, is having the opportunity to bless others. Thank you, Jesus. It's been, been an amazing week. One of the things that... Uh, you know what, before I even get into that, I just want, I really feel this morning, I'd like to have everybody stand. Linda, if you would put uh, the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 9, uh, up there. I didn't put this on the list for you, but I just this morning was feeling, I would love to read this together. We've not done this for a long time. Jesus instructs everybody to pray in this manner. And let's read it together. Are we there? Our Father in heaven... Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Let's just start over. Uh, we we kind of got out of sync. It was almost, I start, you, let's, let's do it together, all together. Are you ready? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's read the next two verses. For if you forgive men their trespasses... Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Lord Jesus, we, just, we thank you for your word, for your awesome, incredible, powerful word. And I just pray, as it says, your kingdom come, your will be done here this morning on earth as it is in heaven. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Start talking about the amazing things that, that, that have happened this week in this, in this busy, busy week. And just over a week ago, we had a fire in one of our rental properties. And, and the roof burnt off the house and... Thank God that the lady that lived there was able, you know, she got out. The fire department showed up. You know, they put out the fire, and uh, now I just have the mess to deal with. And, and when you have a fire, a mess like that and a loss, one of the first things that you end up dealing with is an adjuster. An insurance adjuster comes around. And sometimes these guys almost seem like the enemy. <laughs> If you've ever been through that, sometimes it just almost seems that way, that, you know, it's almost like a battle. Well, this gentleman called me and we had a conversation on the phone and, and uh, he said, well, uh, I say, you've already seen the house. You've already, you know, yep, yep, yep. I got the pictures. I've, I've already been there. I've seen it. Uh, I said, well, then why don't you just come and meet me at my house then? And so he came into my domain 
he came into the house, he sat down at our table, and we've got a table, and it overlooks the, the city of Caldwell, and, you know, we've got this view, and, and we make really good coffee, too. <laughs> so he sat down at the table, and, and we, I fixed, you know, hooked him up with some coffee, and, and we began to, to sit there and visit, and we talked for a little while, just a little while, about the fire, the situation that we had in the fire, and pretty quick, this guy's starting to pour his heart out to me. It's like, wow, thank you, Jesus. This guy's not the enemy after all. And, man, he started to tell me some of the things that, he, that he's been through and some of the, the struggles that he's just, you know, been having not that far in the past. And one of those was a divorce. And, and, and he started just, I'm talking the adjuster sitting in my house at my kitchen at my table pouring out his heart to me. And I was like, wow, how did this happen? And it's like, oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, another divine encounter, an appointment that you set up for me, Lord. And as he began to, to share, he started talking about the hurts in his life. And I, I'm just sitting there mostly listening and, and shaking my head. Wow, you know, mm, mm, wow. And thinking, Lord, there are so many hurting people out there that are just looking for the atmosphere and the opportunity to be able to pour their hearts out to somebody that has the compassion, that cares enough to listen. And so I, I listened to that for probably about, about 20 minutes. And, and then he started talking about, you know, well, my ex, she played the piano in the church. And it's like, whoa, okay. And he says, and I was part of a, a men's group in the church and I cooked the meal on Wednesday night in the church that, that I went to. And he says, when I went through this, and this is where he, he almost broke down a little bit when he was talking to me. He says, when I went through this, he said, not one of the guys from the men's group called me to see how I was doing. He says, and I went back to the church because I felt like that's, that's, where, you know, that's where my roots were. That's where I'm a part of. And, and I went back to the church. And he said, and I just felt like a piece of dirt in the church now. And I was like, oh, man. I don't know if this guy knows what I do or why he's telling me all this stuff. You know, I, just, I was just listening to, to that and, say, and just telling him, wow, I'm really sorry. And... And then he, he shared a little more and like poured a little more of his heart out and I was like, good grief. And then, <laughs> the next place that he went to about tipped me over a little bit. He said, you know, I've been to an adjuster's meeting and he says, and we were talking in the meeting and he says, in this meeting, he said, uh, we were sharing some of the most difficult people there are to adjust with because they're always expecting more and they think that they're special and that they should have something more. And he said, our pastors. And I was like, oh, oh. oh good. <laughs> well, either you just turned into the enemy or you don't know who I am, one or the other. <laughs> Thank God it was the latter. But, and he just started to share that and I thought, man, how sad that is. That somebody who you know, felt like he's poured his life into the church, when it turned around that he needed the church, he's feeling like a piece of dirt and just completely rejected. It's like, oh Lord, help me here to, 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 to help to bring back some restoration into, into his life. And so I started to ask him a few more questions and he said, well, now... The good news is I am remarried and I go to another church, 10 Mile Community Church. Now, he says, and, and, and I love it there and I'm being blessed. And I was like, oh, whew. so there's a happy ending to this story. Thank God. But I said, after we talked a little longer, I said, well, I'm almost reluctant to, uh, to tell you what I do on a daily basis where I spend most of my time and my energy. And uh, I says, I'm a pastor, and he's like, oh, oh. Uh, and uh, I said, but how important it is that, that, we, that we love one another and that we're able to forgive. 
I'm just, I was just thinking that this man still needs to walk out some steps of forgiveness because there's still enough of a hurt down here in, in his heart from the church that he's going to a different place and to a different church and, and he's liking it, but he's not participating. He's just sitting on the pew, watching, waiting, and seeing what happens there. And I just think, God just spoke to me through that whole thing and saying, about the church. Who is the church? We are. We are. We are the church. It wasn't the church that hurt this guy. It was the people that hurt this guy because of some of their perception and their perspective on what's supposed to happen and what's supposed to take place in the church. But the church is where people come to get healed. The church is where people come for hope for restoration. And what is our job? To encourage them in that hope, to bring them up in that hope, to, to, to pray for them, to give them the tools they need to be successful in their walk with the Lord, right? And I was just thinking of what's the most important part of the church, and that's unity. Unity, that we love one another, that we have one another's back, that we're concerned for each other, and the needs that the other one has, the one that's sitting next to you, what their need might be. And I was thinking, we are the church. You and I, we are the the church. We represent the church. The church was God's idea for a hope, to bring a hope and a healing and a reconciliation to a hurting world, right? The focus of the church, the reason for the church, the purpose of the church is that wrapped in a nutshell. And the church is us. I was thinking through that. I was thinking, you know, we are the church. And then I was thinking in terms of unity, unity, family, we're part of the family of God. So family is the church, right? The church is family. So I started thinking unity, one body, a part of a body. We should be saying, we is the church. (laughs) Did you follow that? Yeah. Yeah. Singular, when we come together as one, we is the church, huh? (laughs) Put that away that you can remember it. That's just a little bit different. Say, where were you educated? Well, I graduated from Caldwell High School. I've lived here in Idaho for a long time, Tim. And I'm bragging about that. That's not a, that's not a disclaimer or an excuse right there. Okay, I, I want to... Thinking about the church and the mission of the church and where we're supposed to be, we are representatives of Jesus Christ. We're his ambassadors. We are that hope for a hurting world. That's you and me. We is the church. I was thinking, where does the church end up going so wrong when I hear a hurting individual that's sitting at my table, supposed to be there doing a bunch of business, and 45 minutes of the conversation is the hurts that are happening in his life right now. What's going wrong with the church? And I I thought, I heard a, a gentleman named Sean Smith here just a few years ago. I only heard him one time, but this left a really huge impact in my heart and spirit, my mind. And he was talking about, uh, you remember when, not all of you are quite the same age as me, you've not lived for uh, six decades, but back a long time ago, somewhere back in the 1900s, you used to go in for a smallpox vaccination. And you stood in a line, it's like a line, I can remember it was in the cafeteria at my school. So you stood in the line of the hallway waiting to go into the cafeteria, not exactly sure what was going to happen to you when you got in there. And you saw the other kids come out the other end and some of them were crying and holding their arm and saying, oh, I'm sure excited about this. <laughs> but it wasn't an option, you had to do it. So we went through, went through the line and, you know, stepped up there and, and they start 
pecking a hole, and I think everybody that's had that still has a scar on their shoulder right there if you had the smallpox vac <laughs> uh, vaccination there, inoculation. And he, Sean was talking about, he said, you know, sometimes the church and religion is a whole lot like that vaccination. He said, where you've had just enough, just enough injected, you've been vaccinated with just enough to develop resistance to it. It's like, oh, ah. Just enough religion that you develop a resistance to a true move of God. It's like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa where we see when we've gained just enough knowledge and, and, and start to create our theology, our perspective on what church should be, how it should be run and done, and then we have created a monster. <laughs> we've been immunized, we've been vaccinated, we've been inoculated, and we have developed through that a resistance to a true move of God. Wow, Lord, we don't ever want to have just enough that we resist the real thing. We want all that you have for us, Lord. I, I just want it all, Lord. I just want breakthrough. All that you have for me, Lord, I, I, I'm open for it. I don't want to resist any of it. And I put together this, this message and uh, Linda, you can put it, this up there, however, in whatever order that you want. But I got three steps that I feel are, are critical. I felt like the Lord started stirring things up and, and showing me some things. And, and one, two, three. And it's S-B-K. Three words. The first thing that we need to do is submit. The second thing that we need to do is build. The third thing that we need to do is know. Submit, build, and know. SBK. And we're going to break this down. Got scriptures for, these, for, for, for each of these things. And I, I think of submit. Uh, in James 4, verse 7, it says, God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Submit to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So this, this is the opening right here. And, and I think of a story that's so applicable to, <laughs> to exactly how this works, uh, or at least in part to how this works. I have uh, four children. My first kid, I thought, was the perfect child, my eldest, Sean. Man, everything that he wanted to do was to, to please Dad. I mean, he would sit on my chest from the time he was just a tiny little kid, and he's sitting on my chest and making noises and... and uh, and, and everything that he did was just pleasing to me, his father. And then my second child came along. And uh, when my eldest was two years old, my second son came along, Cody Jack, CJ. And that little twerp, I can remember this so well. I can remember this so well. He was just a little over two years old. I remember the house that I lived in. I remember all of the details about this right now as, as I... As I, as I talk about this, uh, he's like two, two and a half years old, and his will started to rise up. We were sitting in the living room in this little house, 1979, uh, spring of 79, and uh, he, he was doing something, and he created a little bit of a mess, and he's just running around. I can remember him just in his diaper, nothing else, just his diaper, and I said, Cody, he's about two and a half by now. I said, Cody, pick that up and take it back. It's like, mm, he's ignoring me. It's like, he just ignored me. It's like, Cody, Cody, pick that up and take it back in there where you got it. Take that back in your bedroom. It's like, Cody. I need you to pick that up and take it back in the bedroom. It's like shining me on, just not paying attention. And so I gave him some swats. He would not listen to me. I gave him about two swats. And the way I always have done it with my kids 
is I would take my belt off, a leather belt, <laughs> leather, <laughs> leather belt off, and give myself some swats right there on the leg. So I knew exactly how hard I was going to be hitting them, how much it hurt. Because I want to get his attention, I want to create a benchmark so he'll remember this. He's got something to go back to. So I was like, whack, whack, whack. Well, that always scared my kids when they started seeing me do that because they know they're getting it next. So I swapped myself a few times, but this is Cody's first, probably two and a half years old. So I take him, I turn him around and swat, swat, swat. Three swats on those little bare legs. And bleh, he's just... He's just crying, and I, I direct him over to it to pick it up so he'll take it back. And instead, he turns around, comes into my arms, and just cries on my chest. And I was like, oh, this does hurt me more than it hurts you, son. Now, okay, now go get it. Pick it up and take it back. Oh. It's like, uh, Cody... No, Cody, pick it up and take it back. It doesn't count that you're sorry and that you're crying into my chest. That doesn't count. You need to change your behavior. You need to do what Daddy's telling you to do. Go pick it up and take it back. And I can see little, little red marks that it's starting to leave on those little... Yeah. <laughs> Statute of limitations is up, my dear. I can't, I can't go to jail for this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then I, I help him. Together, we, we walk over to that. He picks it up in a bucket of tears, still crying. Trails back with me following him, encourage him puts it back in the bedroom, and then he falls into my arms, and I'm, I'm love on him, and I, I hug on him, and his will submitted to my will, finally. It took some pretty serious encouragement, and I helped him, and I helped him walk that out, you know. But he did it. He, he submitted. And if at two and a half years old, he had not submitted to my will, because I know what's best for him. He's, gonna, he's going to grow up in life through his toddler years and, and into his middle age, middle years, middle age, you know, into junior high and teen years and stuff, and know that he needs to submit his will to his father's will. And when he does that, things are going to be so much better for him because I know what's best for the little twerp. And I can speak some wisdom into his life. And if his will is submitted to my will, he can receive that. We used to heat with wood, and, and he won't have to go over and touch the stove. Now dad can tell him, don't touch that stove, son. Okay, that will burn you. There are things that I can speak into his life if his will has been submitted to mine and his desire is to please me that I would not be able to had I let him just operate and have and watch his will continue to grow. Does that make sense? So what is the first thing that we need to do? Submit to God. Now we can... Oh, my man, we can go through the prayer and we can ask Jesus to come into our heart and then we can go out and just continue to do the same stupid things that we're doing and we can come back to him and we can cry on his chest and cry on his chest and it's the next revival and it's the next church camp and it's the next opportunity to go up to the front and cry on his chest again, but it's submit to his will, be led by his spirit Repent and turn. It's not about go back and cry on his chest. My son did that and it didn't work. There was something that he needed to do to correct his behavior. And we talked about this last week in, in uh, Romans 8.13 when it says those of us that are, when we are led by the Spirit. Romans 8.13 is by 
the Spirit, we put death to the deeds of our flesh. When by the Spirit we make changes, because we are empowered by the Spirit to make changes. Right? right? Everybody with me? That's a bonus. Romans 8.13 again. We're going back to it. Okay. So there are things when we have submitted ourselves to the Spirit of God, using that Spirit to empower us to make the change, that the fruit in our life will definitely be changed. Our behavior will be different. We'll make those corrections, and we will be blessed and empowered through it. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And he will flee from you because you were led by the Spirit, because you have a Spirit that has now been submitted to the Holy Spirit. Looking for leading, asking for guidance. Thank you, Jesus. Second is build. Build on a foundation of love. I want to turn to Ephesians 3, and we're going to read verses 14 through 19. Are you there? Oh boy. Ephesians three, fourteen. For this reason, now Paul is talking to the church of Ephesus and to the to the people there, and he says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom from the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, and who is you? It's us. That he would grant me, he would grant us, according to the riches of his glory, he would grant us to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That our inner man would be strengthened by the spirit of God. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and in this indwelling through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, all understanding, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Oh, is that powerful right there? Yes. That we may be rooted and grounded in love. Now I think about what, what does rooted and grounded in love mean to you? It means when I think about a tree, I worked on a, on a tree farm my junior year in high school, a bronze tree farm out there. And being rooted and grounded, being rooted, I think of, of the tree, where the tree picks up its nourishment is through the roots, right? Yes. Yes. What, what is rooted down into. And when we are rooted in love, what does that mean? Rooted in love. Think about that. That we each would be rooted in love. I was thinking, okay, that our nourishment, that the things that we think, the things that we do, the things that we believe are rooted in love. And that we build on a foundation, that we be grounded in love. That the foundation that we build our walk, that we build our beliefs, that everything we're building on is a foundation of love. And that we are rooted, I say again for the fourth time, rooted in love. That the nourishment that we take is through love. We're pulling it up through love. Everything that we think, everything that we do is filtered through love, right? And the foundation of all of our beliefs and the foundation of our walk, of our Christian walk, and all that we do 
is built on a foundation of love. I want you to turn with me one more time to John. We're going to look at the 15th chapter of John, and we're going to dig a little deeper into, uh, into love here. Renee used this, this sometimes it just cracks me up. The Holy Spirit is so amazing sometimes. It says, 15th chapter, I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You've are, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in me. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they're burned. But if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Ah, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you'll be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and I abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And that's what I've said. Just wow. Wow, Lord, wow. Abide. Does everybody know what abide means? Abide. I, I've just, I did a little bit of a study last night on, on abide. Really just trying to meditate on, on this word abide because it's abide, 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 abide. And my first thought is just abide is your abode. It's where you live. It's where you dwell. Your dwelling place is your abode, so you, that's where you live. Abide. Abide in me. Abide in my love. Build a foundation of love, rooted in love, abiding in his love. And if, when we back up into 1 John and it says, man, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word. So who was the Word? Jesus, if my word abides in you, (laughs) and you abide in my word, and you keep my word, it's like abide. It means to hang out there, to to stay there. When I first thought of abide means where I live, but you know, where I live, 2004 Lincoln, I'm there sometimes. Where I live, I sleep part of the time, I eat there, but I'm gone a whole lot. Abide is something that is a constant, significant part of who I am and what I do. So when I'm rooted and grounded in His love, let's talk about in His love, that is my abiding place. That means I'm taking that to work with me. Um, the things that I'm thinking about are being filtered, are being nourished through that root that's tapped into love. That all of the things that I do in my business, and you know, sometimes it's so easy for us to think, for for many people to think that this is my church self, this is my business self, and I may need to take my church hat off to go do some business. But when we're abiding in His love, when His Word is in us and we are in His Word, and how do we get in his word? <laughs> how do we live in the word? Live in Jesus, abide in Jesus, abide in his word. This is his word. We can abide, we can hang out in this word right here. And the love of Jesus. When, when everything we do is filtered 
through the love of Jesus, it's like our perspective begins to change. I think, let's talk about church again. I think here just a few weeks ago, there was a cup of coffee, which was not supposed to be in here. You're only supposed to have water in here. But this our guest speaker, somebody served her a cup of coffee, and she brought that coffee in and, and set it down right there. And she asked somebody to come up here to, to sing a prophetic word, and that girl jumped up, Kendra. She kicked that coffee over. The lid came off, poosh, and that coffee just went all over the floor right there. I was thinking, wow, that's, that's a big cup of coffee right there, <laughs> all over the floor. I was thinking, man, we can, we can turn our heads on that and, and pretend like uh, it never really happened because I wasn't supposed to be in the church in the first place. <laughs> and then it's going to leave a mark. There's going to be a stain there that we're all going to get to see. Or somebody could clean that up. And I was just sitting there thinking through this process and trying to be engaged in what's happening up here on the on the platform. But instantly, I think it was I think that was you. Somebody jumped down there and started to clean up that mess that was created that somebody had dumped over on the on the floor. And then it wasn't very long until our expert, Sarah, jumped in. And church continued on. God continued to move while this cleanup took place right in front of our eyes. You know, and it wasn't really even a big distraction. It was something that somebody came in with something that wasn't necessarily supposed to be in the church. Shouldn't, it shouldn't have been in here. Shouldn't have happened in here. But it came into the church. It happened. It spilled out on the floor. And, man, nobody was condemned. The mess got cleaned up. There's no spot left on the floor. And it didn't even distract anybody, really. Probably except me. I'm looking out of the corner of my eye thinking, is it clean yet? Is it clean yet? (laughs) Church is the safe place for us to come because the church is us for us to be able to bring in our junk, spill it out. I just feel like that was a, a, what do you call it? Yeah, prophetic. Something that happened in the natural that actually was a prophetic thing that as I watch that play out, it's like, yes, Lord, you know, that's exactly what this is. This is a place for you to be able to come spill out your junk around the altar, right? (laughs) Right here. And there will be somebody to help you get it cleaned up. And you walk out with the mess cleaned up. You feel good. You got it. Pour it out. It's, it's, it's taken care of because it's a safe place where the people here genuinely love because they're rooted and grounded in love and everything that they do, say, think is supposed to be filtered through love when we build on a foundation of love. Everybody with me? All right. And that's what we want to be, a unified bunch of lovers. And when I think about what we have, and I think of the unity that we have right now, I think we is the church because we are family, and family is church, is the family of God. I think... That's something that each one of us, you know, the last thing that we want is division in this body. Something that every one of us needs to be aware of, acutely aware of. You love the unity that we have. You love the feeling that you have when you come here, knowing that there's the the believers, that the brothers and sisters that love you and care for you, and they'll pray for you, and they'll be honest with you. Then you protect that. And when somebody comes with a divisive spirit, sometimes even a little bit sneaky that you don't recognize, but they start talking things that, you know, what does God hate? One of the things that he hates is somebody that causes division and separation. Anytime somebody comes in with something and wants your ear to complain about something, it's like, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. We don't do that here. 
That's not us. We don't do that here. That's not the pastor's job to be looking over that all the time. It's each one of us because we is the church. We want the unity. We protect the body. Division? No, we don't want division. We don't want strife. We don't want separation. We don't want factions. We want to be one loving body of Christ. Build on a foundation of love. Build on a foundation of love. Our thoughts, when we're going to work, our job, man, seek to understand through a root, a tap root of love. Approach everything filtered through love. Okay, last, and this is something that is so incredibly, incredibly important, is know. Know that you are a new creation. You are a new creation. If you look at 2 Corinthians, we're going to read 5 through 17. Are you there? Me too. 2 Corinthians 5, we're starting at verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you're abiding in his love, he is a new creation. So I want all of you to just say it. I'm a new creation. creation. Again. This is something that I think every one of us could do. We could stick this up on the mirror. We could look at ourselves in the mirror and convince ourselves, knowing I am a new creation. Again. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A new creation, all things have become new. The old man is dead, dead, dead. The old man is dead. Through the Spirit, I have put to death the flesh, the old man. With the power of the Holy Spirit living in me, I've tapped into, I have put to death the flesh. I have turned from by submitting to God, by building on a foundation of love. I have become a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old man is dead. All things have become new. When somebody asks me, there's, we'll go back to Romans 8.1, it says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, abiding in his love, there's no condemnation because the old man is dead. And second, that wasn't me, that was the old man. When the enemy, when the accuser of the brother comes back to you and says, oh, but what about remember? And you can be guaranteed that he'll use other people to come back to you and say, but what about when you remember that time when... It's like, oh no, oh no. That wasn't me because the old man is dead. dead. Thank you, Jesus. All things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us, has given who? And what's he given us? The ministry of reconciliation. That's helping those that are lost, helping those that are hurt, reconciling them back into right standing by the life that we live, by the example that we show, because we are rooted and grounded in love. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, so not holding their sins against them, pointing their sins out to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. So who is he using? Us. Us. 
We is the church. Yeah, us, the church. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I want to close with a story. Uh, a friend of mine, some of you would know, uh, Dominic Monero. That was one of the th other things that we did. That I did this week was I went and did a, a jail visit to Dominic, and man, I ended up blessed in that. We had a prayer time together that I just went out of there. It's like, oh yes, and Dominic's standing there with big eyes, going, "Wow, that was powerful." So God visits the jail. He, he, he doesn't care where it's at. We're supposed to be bringing the hope to those who are in prison, to those who are in jail. But Dominic was sharing a story with me, and it's been a while back. This wasn't in this visit that was a couple of days ago. But he said, yeah, I had this friend. He says, uh, see, because Dominic has spent 42 of his 59, 60 years now, 42 of his 60 years were institutionalized like in jail, in prison, whatever. And, and one of those stays in prison, he was telling me, he said, you know, I was with this guy, with this, I thought it was a, a friend of mine, and he said, I was riding with this friend, and sure enough, the cops, the cops come. He says, the men, they uncovered, a, you know, a bag of dope in there, and uh, he said, I was just thinking, this guy's got a good job, he's got kind of a business kind of deal, and not just selling dope, but I mean, a good job, and, and uh, he's got a wife, and he's got a kid, and he said, so... I said, yeah, that's, it's mine. It's mine. And he said, the cops are going, well, are you sure? It's under the, yeah, it's mine. And the other guy just kept his mouth shut. Because, yeah, it's all mine. It's mine. I will take it. I'll take it. So Dominic took the rap. He spent either three or five years in prison for that, paying the price for the penalty for a sin, a trespass that someone else had committed. Dominic stepped up and, and, and took the rap for it. And as he was telling me that, I was thinking, oh my goodness. But here's the really sad part of that. That guy never ended up writing him a letter, giving him a visit. Or, those of you that know a little bit about jail, you put money on somebody's books. When they're in jail or they're in prison, they, they have an account. Because all they do is just feed you a, a minimum they don't give you your own TV or anything. This is certainly no palace. All they do is give you enough to survive in there. So it's really important that you have somebody that will put money on your books, they call it. Somebody that on the outside that will, you know, that will help you out a little bit on the inside. And that guy didn't help him out, never put any money on his books, never a thank you, never a visit, never anything. And I just think, you know, we have a heavenly father we have who sent his son to do that exact thing for us so we don't have to pay the price the penalty for our sins the price for our trespasses he came and he took care of all that for us and i just was thinking oh dominic i feel so bad for you but you know what that's how Jesus had to feel and how God had to feel when he sent his son to pay the price for everything that you ever have done, ever did do, ever will do. The price has been paid because that sacrifice that he made, he raised up his hands and said, I'm, I'm guilty. You know, crucify me. I'm guilty. Back in the Old Testament, there was death required. The penalty for sin was death. I was looking some of that, studying some of that here over the last couple days and looking in the Old Testament. And you know, if you had an unruly son, someone who, like, not like my two and a half year old, but if you had somebody who would not mind, who was unruly, would not submit, and that was sinful in their ways, that you took that son and you took him to the elders, they took him to the gate of the city, stoned him, they killed him. Death was the penalty for sin, even if it was your own kid. Now, 
Man, there's one of the things that we have to be thankful for right now is that's no longer the case because the death has already taken place. Jesus was the sacrifice. He's the one that died, that shed his blood, raised his hand and said, I'll go. I'll go in Matt's place. I'll go in Dio's place. I'll pay that price. I'll serve the sentence. I'll pay the price. And that's where God has done for each one of us. And the thing that we need to be so thankful for this morning is, thank you, Jesus, that you paid that price for me, that you died on that cross, that you shed your blood, that I could stay out, that I could be free, that I could be truly free to worship you, to live, to be with my family. Thank you, Jesus. Pastor Rutzen. I just think that if God. one of the things that we need to continually, continually be thankful, be grateful, be appreciative, to share with our Heavenly Father how grateful we are that He paid that price for us, for each one of us. Not like Dominic's friend that said, man, I'm glad you did the time for me and, you know, I, I'm out here and free. But that we're thanking him. We're praising him. We are putting money on his books. Shall we stand together? Lord, we just ask you right now to plant this word in our heart and that our heart will be good soil upon which the good seed can root and spring forth and bear fruit. So right now, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will direct us and direct our thoughts that we can accommodate and fulfill this message this morning. I'd like for every one of you to be in contemplation right now of one of these steps that probably all of us are in somewhere it may be there's someone here that needs to submit it doesn't mean that you're a bad person Cody wasn't a bad boy but he needed to learn to be obedient and to submit and there are those possibly here today that you're at a point and a station in life when you need to learn to submit, to be willing to say, thy will be done. God knows best. Amen. God knows best. He knows more than you. He knows more than me. And God knows what's best for you. And the best security and the best assurance for a future for your life is when you reach that point that you can say, I surrender all, Lord, to you. I give you my will. I give you my stubborn nature. I give you my carnal nature, Lord. I surrender. I submit it to you. And there are those that maybe have taken that step, but Today you need to begin a construction project in your life and begin to build, begin to establish, begin to work on that building on a sure foundation. You need to do some building today. And then possibly there are those that just need to understand better who you are that you are God's priceless child. You are so loved. You are so loved by your Father that He wants the best for you. And so right now, how many here feel like you're in one of those stages? Let me see your hand. You're somewhere in those stages. All everyone really continues in a spirit of 
prayer and submission to the Spirit of the Lord. I'd just like to ask for those right now who feel like it's time for you to submit. I'd like for you just to wave your hand at me. You need to submit. Praise God. Praise God. Whether it's for the direction of your life your, or it's to give your heart to God, to walk a new life, a new path. Those of you that feel you're at that point, would you just come down here with me and we're going to pray before you leave. We're going to pray God's going to do a real work in your life today. The chastisement of the Lord is easy because He was wounded for our transgressions. Do you understand that? He took our place. He bore our stripes. He already paid the price. And now it's up to us to submit. Hallelujah. Maybe some of you here for the first time are going to say yes to the will of God. You're going to say, I'm through with my old life of sin and carnality, and I'm going to serve God. As for me, I'm going to serve the Lord. Praise God. I want this family, I want this church right now to pray together right now for these as they pray their prayer of submission to the Lord. Jesus, I pray right now that you would just speak to these hearts. Help them, Lord, to say yes to you. Praise God. And so if this is your first time, I'll pray with you. And you just repeat with me if you would. Lord Jesus, I come to you. And I submit my life and my heart to you. I surrender my will. I surrender my carnality. I surrender my sinful, sinful nature. And I ask your forgiveness. I submit my heart, Lord, to you. I give my heart to you. Wash me. Cleanse me. I am your child. And you love me. And I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. I thank you for it. And I thank you for your forgiveness. Now just lift, lift your heart and your hands to Jesus and thank him. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. And now I'm going to ask for those who feel like you need to build on some things. You've just sort of been idle and non-progressing in the spirit of the Lord and you need to build today right quickly those of you that need to do some building today come towards the front here I want you to take some action today I want you to pick up a spiritual tool I want you to get some plans out and say it's time to build it's time to build it's time to build some things in my life become stronger become more spiritual, become more active, to become more involved. I'm going to build, I'm going to build, I'm going to build. Hallelujah. Right now, Lord Jesus, I pray for these who understand they're in a building progress process. You're touching their lives, Lord, today with a sense of building up their faith, building up their trust in you, building up their commitment to you. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, right now I pray that the spirit of building will come upon them and that they'll, this week, begin to construct some things that's going to bring them into fulfillment, maturity, and strengthen the body of Christ. That they're going to be used of you, Lord, and become a, a vessel, a temple, a building in which you dwell and which you work. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And now maybe there's those of you here who just haven't understood who you are. Who you are. I believe it's time for revelation to come from God. A spirit revelation to come to you of who you are in Jesus Christ. 
that you're a loved, that you're a forgiven, that you're an anointed child of God. Hallelujah. Open your mind, your understanding right now to the revelation of God's Spirit upon you. Lift your hands right now. This needs to be everybody in the building. Just lift your hands towards the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, Jesus, I pray that the spirit of revelation will come upon these today in your house. I pray, oh God, that you will reveal to them through the Holy Spirit their value, their purpose, their identity, their calling. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Right now, you're revealing to them. You're unfolding to them who they are in you they are forgiven they're anointed hallelujah they're chosen they're chosen you chose them oh god you called them and drew them to you oh god help us to understand how precious we are in your sight for you loved us so that you gave your only begotten son that if we would just believe in you, we would have everlasting life. Hallelujah. Reveal to us, O oh God, your great love and marvelous provision for us. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Just let revelation flow through this room right now, Jesus. Give us an understanding more than we've ever understood before. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, you're a child of God. You're a child of God. You belong to Jesus. You belong to Jesus. You belong to Jesus. You're a servant of the Lord. Hallelujah. You are loved of God. You are loved of God. You're a child of God. He loves you. He loves you with an unmeasurable love. You are a vessel of God. God loved you. You are a child of God. And He loves you with an unfailing love. You are loved of God. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. You're a child of God, and He loves you.